I hope this works uh, nicely. Uh, two things outside the manuscript to begin with. First of all, I have a manuscript. So those who know me is normally I just have a few PowerPoints which guide me through whatever I'm going to talk about. And often I don't know what I'm going to talk, to, to talk about when I start. But doing the Helga Eng felt somewhat, mm, you can't do it as usual. So I really wrote a whole text. It's, and this has an advantage for you. You can get a copy when I'm done. So you can simply keep on sleeping or whatever you're doing right now. <laughs> you don't have to listen anyway. As this is not a finalized version, as I hadn't had the time to do the, the listing of the references, which is still lacking, so, but uh, it will follow. And then I have to figure out what to do about the text. A second, uh, Ola told me yesterday I should at least mention my personal connection to Helga Eng, which is somewhat not a real connection, as of course I know about Helga Eng, uh, having written about and done quite a bit about the history of education in general and in Norway especially. But I have a kind of personal relation to her without ever having met her, which is my mother wrote her doctoral thesis uh, about ch children's drawings and their use as a diagnostic tool. As a preschool children and their drawings, how they could be used in medicine for diagnostics. And she needed someone to make those kids do drawings. So I had to join her <laughs> to different hospitals and all kinds of places. Uh, but my drawings, I don't know what happened to them. They were never analyzed. I, I, Analyzed, I believe so at least. I've never <laughs> seen. While the, the, the other kids, of course, were the material of her doctoral thesis. Uh, I only later learned about that this has a clear connection, uh, Helga Eng being the pioneer internationally of using children's drawings as a starting point for analysis. So I have a kind of, uh, what would you call it? I'm coming from Vienna and Freud. I have an early trauma, or <laughs> <laughs> uh, rather, it's not post-traumatic stress, don't worry. <laughs> uh, connection to Helga Eng. OK, so much about that. I did a manuscript. I don't know how is this going to work, because I'm not used to reading uh, manuscripts aloud. I know many colleagues do that, but I hate this. I'm used to doing my opening, uh, so I do the introductory lecture in education in Vienna for 750-something students. And I, I'm used to do it without any kind of manuscript, because I feel it's more lively. And the worst thing edu uh, education people should be is boring. So, and I feel a little bit it will get boring today due to the fact that I will try to keep time and my manuscript. But we'll see how it works out. OK, let's move into what I wrote. First of all, I. I will, of course, thank you for the invitation, which was, came really as a surprise for me, because I'm kind of used that Helga Eng lectures. These are all those brilliant people you read about, have heard about, and once in a while met in your lifetime. So I didn't expect me to be among the candidates for such an event. Not the least, as my involvement with this department started 25, about 25 years ago, I believe, actually. 75 years of Helga Eng, 25 years of this. I still remember the night when I came with the ferry from Kiel to Oslo, uh, first time being invited to the University of Oslo, sitting on deck and uh, thinking about the landscape and what would going to happen, uh, would happen to me. It's actually the first time I met Barrett. Uh, you remember Ian Westbury and Peter Pereira, and we went up to the, uh, uh, Vigelandsparken, and ah, yeah, good. I could tell you memories and memories. The best memory uh, I share here with some of you may be uh, of the older ones. Uh, Lasse, Lasse Löfli uh, ah, and I, we did a series of so-called classical seminars, which I'm still proud of. Uh, we did absolutely useless stuff, talking about essence in Sparta and or talking about the difference between phenology and systems theory or whatever. But it was totally exciting stuff because it was thinking in the making. It was really seminars where you had the feeling you never knew what happens next. 
And as far as I know, many students felt this was one of the biggest things I have been a part of in the doctoral education here. So I'm still kind of sorry that we stopped for different personal and uh, institutional reasons. Uh, when I first got this invitation, um, I was, of course, thinking about doing my, my lecture about something which connects me to Oslo. And you mentioned already Björk. Björk is kind of my Norwegian mum. As I still have a family kind of relation to Gundams, uh, to Björk and Torleif. And I first idea was, of course, uh, some of you know, Björk and I developed one night in her living room the idea of this project, Didactic Meets Curriculum. And the idea was, why not talk about Didactic Meets Curriculum? Uh, it's still a valid issue, as I've been invited uh, only in the last year to places like China, Canada, Sweden, and Germany to talk about didactic meets curriculum. Uh, we had lots of conferences, hundreds of publications, uh, and the issue is, is more or less uh, yeah, all over the place. I did, as a part of the project, when we started, as in mid-90s, a prediction. I said, I would expect the didactic cultures, like Norway or Germany and the like, uh, being heavily influenced by curriculum-based assessment strategies. And I would expect the other way around, that the assessment countries, sooner or later, would start to copy didactic tools like curriculum guidelines. Um, we come back to this issue later today. Uh, and I did a second prediction uh, in, as part of that. I said uh, this uh, alignment of traditions will lead to big, big problems, wreak havoc within the didactic countries, but it wouldn't change much <coughs> the development of the assessment countries. So it took a while, about 15 years, before they actually started doing national curriculum guidelines in the US. So, <laughs> but they did it, and they are still doing it. While we, not the least following the PISA shock and stuff like that, uh, got an assessment frenzy, which is permeating most of the world right now. I would have loved not to be right. When we get back to this, I would have loved to be wrong later today again. Well, it could have been a wonderful opportunity to report about a project which delivered. And you know, in education, you don't have many projects which really deliver. Normally, you end up with way more questions than answers. But I decided not to do so. The first reason for not doing so, it, it wouldn't make sense to invite me to get this done in Oslo. You have Björk. You have Barrett. You have Swine. You have Kirsten. You have Jorun. They are all people who could do this way better than me. So no need to do that again. You have heard about this stuff often enough. The second reason is more important. Uh, I do all kinds, you mentioned it, all kinds of international and empirical research, but the most important reason for changing my topic today is between not yet born and seven years old. My four grandchildren, Lars, Emil, Oscar, Emma, and soon arriving Jan. Because in later years, I started wondering what's going to happen to them. What kind of school will they experience? What kind of future, what kind of education will they get? Lars is now in his second year of uh, Barnes School and of elementary school. And he's so bored and so tired. And, and all his school books are full with competency stuff. And uh, all reading is broken down to answering three questions. And he has by now already started functional reading. He doesn't really understand, he doesn't have to understand the text. The question is, am I able to make the cross at the right point of these stupid questions? And he's pretty good at this. Uh, and just started in second grade. So uh, Lars, Emil, and Oscar, and Emma, and now coming Jan, they have made me turning to very principal, very basic, very foundational questions again. Because kind of worry, what is going to happen to them? So I decided to, to uh, change the topic from the original one, Didactic Meets Curriculum, to the one which you've seen up here, the end of school as we know it, question mark. There is, 
it kind of connects to the last two Helga Eng lectures done by Andy uh, Pollard and, and Lynn Yates. But you will see it's a bit different view on the same issues than theirs, even though I, at least with Lynn, have quite a bit of discussions and we share quite a bit of ideas. Doing so implies a certain risk, I have to admit, because the process I'm going to talk about is not yet decided. It's open. It's work in progress. Or as a South African colleague recently said in a speech, is the jury is out. It's not yet clear what the jury is going to say. And I do not feel I'm really having control of this issue by now. I just have ideas. I have gut feelings. I'm kind of worried about the future of my grandchildren. And, and this is what makes me thinking about. But I saw where, if not here in Oslo, among friends and colleagues, to, to start with some ideas which are not fully developed, not finished yet, which are worrying me. Well, to get into the, oh yeah, I should add one more thing. Um, I've been uh, involved with the Journal of Curriculum Studies now for 20 years. The last four years, I've been general editor of this journal. And this has also shaped quite a bit of my view on what's going on. Uh, this is, I believe, the most important curriculum journal, of course. Uh, but we are at least the only really international one having contributions from really all over the world, from China, from Africa, from wherever. And this has also shaped my views. We did actually a whole issue, the first issue is this year, on these topics, the end of schooling as we know it. So if you want to may, uh, know more about the international discourse on this topic, just turn to the number one issue of Journal of Curriculum Studies this year. By the way, with a small but very important contribution of a lady sitting right in the middle of all of you, Kirsten, uh, joining um, likewise brilliant scholars from Australia, US, Canada, Brazil, and China, and on so on. To address my question, I have to take three steps. First of all, I have to tell you what is schooling as we know it. Secondly, I have to talk about uh, what is happening to schooling as we know it. And in the end, is maybe there is the end of this kind of schooling approaching. And in the end, we have to talk about the question mark. Is this inevitable? Is this a Hegelian process? Or is this something which can be changed? And if so, how? And not the least, this will be my final note, which show do we in education, educational research, play in this development? Okay, let's start with what is schooling as we know it. Uh, one of the key experiences I made as general editor of the journal, and I do lots of reviews, also a couple of hundreds a year for ARA, for other journals, educational research, and so on. When you get old, they use you for all these kinds of reviews. One of the key experiences you make is not what most probably would expect, difference. The key experience you make is how much we have in common. That if it comes from Asia, if it comes from Africa, if it comes from Southern America, if it comes from Australia, we share quite a lot in our beliefs what schools are, what schools do, and what the most pressing problems of schools are nowadays. The basic model is more or less the same all over the world. Also we have some kind of teacher, licensed teacher, teaching a mandatory age group, a more or less fixed curriculum, and specialized place. The structure of the curriculum has been aligned uh, throughout the last century, or the 20th century, so that's a basic division of subjects and uh, tasks and topics is almost for obligatory schooling, for compulsory schooling up to the age of 16 or so, is more or less the same all across the world. Otherwise, stuff like PISA wouldn't be possible because we can expect that most kids have had certain parts of math. Okay, so some kids have had certain parts of, uh, parts of science 
have dealt with certain issues in literary as a language, and so on. We, we believe in that model that we have practically stopped thinking if that's the most reasonable way to teach kids. There have been alternative ways around and alternative routes around to organize schooling. But for most of us, this basic concept of schooling is so deeply rooted, so we have stopped wondering about what the hell are we doing there. You've got to be six years old to start wondering again. Hey, what's going on here? Why do they do that? And uh, this was the funny thing about Lars starting in school. He's living with us, I say, his grandparents. So to get all these basic questions again, why does she do this, the teacher? Why do I have to do that? It doesn't make sense. Tell me. OK. Uh, this type of schooling, um, uh, as this basic model of schooling, I will define it more closely a little bit later. Uh, it took about two and a half thousand years to develop. <coughs> its origins are even older than that. We know that some forms of organized uh, teaching were already around in the high cultures of the Near and Middle East about 4,000 years ago. But there it was only about teaching uh, future administrators and priests and the like. It was a very limited group of future office holders. The first emerging of a kind of public schooling happened somewhat later. It's closely connected to the rise of the city-states in what is now Italy and Greece. <coughs> It started, depending on which historian you take as a reference, let's say about 800, 700, 600 years ago. That the idea came, why not having some kind of joint public schooling? The important thing was, like in the former high cultures, of course, uh, participating in the grown up life wasn't enough to learn what was needed to become a fully participating person later on. So this leads to the idea of someone has to take care of, that you learn somewhere what you can't learn by just being part of your families and your neighborhoods everyday life. The City-states needed some kind of shared attitudes, some kind of shared understandings towards the public, towards the law, towards business or contracts and the like, and most importantly, towards defense. So they couldn't match what they called the barbarians and their power without uh, developing a very close interaction in the city. And there are wonderful descriptions of how this developed in early Athens or Sparta or other places. We did it in our doctoral courses once, the emergence of schooling between Sparta and Athens. Uh, and you know, most of you, you know that as part of your uh, uh, reading list, of course, you all have been through Plato, right? Don't you? So the Republic, uh, the perfect education state where every stage in your development is defined by the degree of schooling you get. So you start as uh, very low, then you can become a tradesman, a warrior, and finally a philosopher, a philosopher uh, who are supposed to govern society and see never-ending schooling, this radical model of a schooling society, where there's no difference between society and schooling at all. But, like Aristotle, his most prominent student and opponent observed right away, there was a problem. The moment I produce some kind of public schooling, what are they going to teach? What is this about? What should we talk about in schools? I have brought you some quotes from the eighth and last chapter of politics, Aristotle's politics, because all what I'm talking about is already in this chapter. So all you have to do is read that chapter. None will doubt that the legislator should direct his attention above all to the education of youth, for the neglect of education do does harm to the constitution. The citizen should be molded to suit the form of government under which he lives. For each government has a peculiar character which originally formed and which continues to preserve it. 
The character of democracy creates democracy. The character of oligarchy, oligarchy creates oligarchy. I don't know how to pronounce that. And always, the better the character, the better the government. So, societies need schools to reproduce themselves, and the school is the most prominent expression of what a society is about. And he continues now. Again, for the exercise of any faculty or art, a previous training and habituation are required. Clearly, therefore, the practice of virtue. And since the whole city, we are talking about education in the frame of the city-state, has one end, it is manifest that education should be one and the same for all, and that it should be public and not private, not, at, not as at present, when everyone looks after his own children separately and gives them separate instruction of the sort which he thinks best. The training in things which are of common interest should be the same for all. This is the very first historically explicit definition of the purpose of common schooling. But, he says, that it, this education should be regulated by law and, uh, and should be an affair of the state is not to be denied. But what should be the character of this public education and how young sh a person should be educated are questions which remain to be cons considered. As things are, says this translation, the German translation from the same passage of Aristotle, say, in modern times, in modern times, there is a disagreement about the subjects. For mankind are by no means agreed about the things to be taught, whether we look to virtue or the best life. Neither is, is it clear whether education is more concerned with intellectual or with moral virtue. The existing practice is perplexing. No one knows on what principle we should proceed. Should the useful in life or should virtue? Or should the higher knowledge be the aim of our training? All three opinions have been entertained. And you just remember your last election campaign and you will know all those issues again. They haven't disappeared. Now, what he does right away in this eight chapter is he dismisses only useful knowledge as vulgar knowledge. He says, this is not enough. His key point is, um, uh, Plato had already explained in uh, Menno, there is a problem about Virtue, you can't teach virtue. There's no way to teach it. The only thing what you can do, as he does in Menno, is you can challenge the knowledge of someone, which then allows the subject to develop, or more precisely, to discover its own virtues. So it's nothing you can teach directly. And this is actually the course Aristotle takes in the following. He kind of tries to define, oh, what is this? Uh, he kinds uh, of define, oh no, we are too fast. How to get back? He tries to define uh, which content is good for cultivating virtues. So for him, it's a combination of knowledge and virtue, but knowledge is always seen as a basic for developing your own virtues, your own character. I will use this differentiation in the following, in a somewhat different wording. I talk about qualification and cultivation. For Aristotle, it's quite clear that qualification is about cultivation. The purpose is not yet to are able to do something specific. The purpose is what it does to your character development. This curriculum, which he lines out, uh, developed uh, Already 100 before Christ, you have a pretty standardized curriculum throughout the Latin and Greek world, which came to be known as the seven liberal arts, which then existed about 1,500 years as dominating curriculum in uh, Europe, at least. And already in Roman times, this created quite a lot of problems because this curriculum was not usable. It was not directly connected to things you may use in life. So I have here the famous quote, which most of you have heard the other way around. Uh, the real quote is, not for life, but for school we learn. This is the original. It's jokingly by Cicero about contemporary schooling in Rome, where it says, whatever you learn in school, you do for school. 
it's only uh, in 19th century education which turned it around and created this funny notion of we learn for life in schools. It wasn't shared by them. Now, we could now follow this uh, history of qualification against cultivation throughout history for quite a while. Just in another stage in this process is the early Christianity, which had to deal with the fact of persecution. They couldn't trust public spaces as educational spaces. So they had to develop a highly sophisticated way of teaching, which ends up with Augustine and others at really the same point. Augustine declares uh, in his most important educational writing, it's not about how much you know about the Bible and God, but it's how much education connects to your doubts, to your problems, to your insecurities, also how much it connects to the forming of yourself, which is the important point for turning you into a Christian. But I have already lost my manuscript somehow. <laughs> Going back to Athens, we talk in Athens about 5% of the youth. It's only the boys, only of full citizens. In medieval ages, it's not getting more, not much more at least. We are talking mostly only about boys. And the division of education, which was around in Rome and in Athens, namely, you had on the one side some kind of private schooling taking care of qualifications, and you had on the other side some kind of public schooling, not the least military training, taking care of the forming of habits and beliefs. This division of labor existed until around 16th century. Okay? Which is what Aristotle already observed. Parents were most interested, of course, in useful stuff. Kids should learn something they were in need of. The public, as the state, or later on the church, was mostly interested in cultivation, to including you in a certain way of seeing world, in a certain way of believing. And this division of labor coexisted basically until late 18th century. But it started to crumble. It started to get into the difficulty, of course, with Reformation Age, which is our next point for a short stop. Luther followed. He was Augustine monk. You know, I know you. I believe you will know that. He followed pretty much Augustine's basic idea. He talks about the combination of Christian and worldly wisdom as a double approach to teaching as what I call qualification and cultivation is, in Luther's case, the combination of Christian and worldly wisdom. <laughs> and again, Reformation runs into the problem that most parents were not interested in the cultivation part of this business, while the emerging new states of the Reformation age and the new and often changing uh, religious denominations were mostly, of course, interested in the cultivation program. This ended by a crucial invention, which I call and have called in different publications the reformatic or reformation compromise, which means mandatory schooling in terms of cultivation, as catechism, religious contents, reading the Bible, and this kind of stuff. Qualification, the scope of qualification, depending on demand and resources. So if you look at post-reformatory school laws, they normally have this combination. There is a part which is obligatory for everyone. This is the part which you need to include people into the new church and the new state. And there is a part which is pretty much dependent on local needs and resources. Uh, even though as a, even this compromise took another 300 years to materialize for most in Central Europe. But there is a problem in this construction, as Luther put it, because this compromise divided qualification and cultivation again in two subject areas. OK? Here, the subjects which you need to become a member of church and state. Here, the subjects you need for your personal life and future. It's a division of 
the two sides of public education, again, like before in different types of schooling, no, now integrated in one type of schooling, but as two different lines of subject, or content, or whatever you call it. This wasn't much, much of a problem in the Lutheran conception of this Reformation school, because he understood also the Christianity part as what we would call nowadays a cognitive thing. If you know what to do, you will do. So much was about teaching kids by heart and explaining to them what catechism and the Bible expected them to do. And the basic belief was if they had learned that and were able to repeat it word by word, they would act accordingly. It was pietism in late 18th century which really challenged that notion and tried to show that actually cultivation and qualification are two sides of the same coin. You need an instruction which is kind of engaging, uh, inspiring, by using content as worldly wisdom to create Christian habits and wisdom. This is about the state of the cultivation qualification deba debate when enlightenment comes around. So that we start wondering, is it right, as we've done for about 2,000 years, to kind of have a division of labor between parts of educa public education dealing with qualification, parts of education dealing with cultivation, to how to mingle, how to get this into one package. Uh, the philanthropists, not only them, but they are the most prominent in Central Europe, they secularize or turn this problem in a civic construction. If you read early Basedo, for example, you find this combination of Christian and worldly wisdom uh, reproduced as public order and individual purity. Rienhill or Orden. If you look at Trapp, the guy who wrote the very first systematic uh, introduction to the science of education, he form, uh, produces, reproduces the same combination as material education and formal education. Material education being what was before the worldly wisdom and formal education being forming of the mind, which then in the next step in early 19th century is turned into the division between school knowledge and ability. And you see what a kind of turnaround. What was once about becoming a Christian is now about unfolding your abilities. Uh, this is a very short and, uh, history of some couple of thousand years. What remains in this debate between qualification and cultivation is the issue Aristotle had seen right away. Who's going to do that and how to do that? Throughout the 19th century, you have a long debate. Should this be a public thing or should this be a private responsibility? The most important figure to uh, put words to the combination of cultivation and qualification was, of course, Herbert who is considered in German-speaking countries as the most important inventor of educational sciences, Herbert speaks in this context about educating instruction. As for, for him, is instruction education by content. As you see, again, this configuration, okay? Content's main purpose is cultivating, educating. It's not primarily about the content as such, the qualification as such, but the educative value of teaching. But Herbert was strongly opposing public schooling. He believed it was duty of the families to organize whatever they felt was right. Uh, the guy who invented the Prussian school system, Humboldt, when he was young, felt that education of any sort was outside the reach of the state. State shouldn't get involved with that at all. Later on, he accepted that states are allowed to set some kind of frame for public education. His fellow Schleiermacher, who helped him designing these reforms, felt, and you know this kind of argumentation nowadays as well, 
felt uh, the state should only be involved as long as civic society wasn't able to do it by itself. <coughs> but none of them succeeded. The big success was the last one in this line, a guy named Hegel, the philosopher of the Prussian state, who simply declared schooling is the process from the warm womb of family to the cult of society. Schooling is a necessary place to get you out of your family ties and your individual beliefs that whatever you think you are to approaching at the level of uh, mankind on uh, phenology. Uh, and you should get rid of whatever kids are in advance to make sure that they get out of the family womb into what he calls in the philosophy of law the cult of society, and that they, used, they get used to deal with the cult of society. <coughs> Even though I give you the German examples, I could tell you pretty much the same story using French examples, Condorcet. I could use US examples, uh, Horace Mann and the discourse about common school. So this is throughout the Western world, the key problem. What is this about, and who's going to run that? To shorten the history version, you find more in the text, but if I read, I, I get crazy. This is what happens throughout the long 19th century. We basically develop a state-run schooling built upon teacher-guided and curriculum-based instruction, which seeks to, seeks to foster a common national spirit among the students while allowing for different degrees of qualification based on what is called ability but actually reflects social background. This is schooling as we know it. It's a basic construction of schooling as we know it, which develops more or less in Europe and in Northern America in 19th century and the, is spread from there throughout to the south and to the east and became throughout the 20th century the predominant model of organizing schooling. The basic use of schools is about fostering a common spirit and allowing for some kind of different qualifications based on needs. If you look at series of schooling which emerge in the shadow of this, if you take Parsons, schooling as socialization, achievement as a tool to create difference, right? Depending on Fendt, most from a German one. School as a place of socialization or inculturation, cultivation, but at the same time producing difference using different degrees and levels of knowledge. And always using ability in the background as an argument why qualifications should be different, whereas cultivation should be more or less the same, or have at least the same goals for all. This model became already challenged in the end of 19th century, not the least by something called the labor movement. Because they complained, why should we share the same kind of cultivation? Why should we provide the same kind of loyalty and the same kind of taxes to the state while not being allowed getting the same qualifications? The equity problem was born already in late 19th century. Much of the left discusses, but it discusses the equity problem right away as unequal distribution of qualification. We get back to that later, because this has lots of problems. It's the one thing which didn't happen, as in the 60s and 70s, in the post-war period, most Western states tried to kind of lessen the tension between those two things, cultivation and qualification, by producing a mass expansion of education. Ever more schooling, ever more. We started once upon a time with kids on average being four to six years in schools. A newborn nowadays has to expect about 20 years of formal education of some kind. Just imagine. Uh, but. At each and every turn of this mass expansion, 
The official argument was to solve the equity problem. Next time around, everybody should have a similar chance to achieve similar levels of qualification. But it never materialized. Ever since Coleman, we have data which show time and again that the idea of equity of qualifications never, ever has worked. Schools are simply not strong enough to change the impact of different opportunities to learn outside school. But anyway, this was a big challenge, but this is not the equity challenge, it's but one side of the equation. The struggle became even more complicated by two developments which are not directly related to schooling or to this basic equation of cultivation and qualification, namely on the inside, the problems of the welfare state to maintain its expansion. You know, like I've argued elsewhere, that the modern state, the nation state, is built around the idea of risk sharing. You know, the state provides you with uh, some help with all the risks of being born, like being educated, being healthy, having secure living conditions, uh, salvation, whatever. So the basic idea of the Western state, by the way, developed not the least in Denmark in late uh, 18th century, was simply this kind of risk sharing. We share your risk in exchange for loyalty and taxes. This was the basic concept. And whenever new problems showed up, we asked for more taxes and provided more institutions. Like I told you, from four to six to 20 years of education. From seeing a doctor once or twice or three times in your lifetime to see him on a monthly or yearly basis. From one type of salvation procedures called church to a whole industry of salvation, calling it counseling, therapy, whatever. So the basic construction had no limit in itself to every problem it reacted by expansion. From the 80s onwards, it became clear that this process of expansion couldn't continue, unlimited. The point return of investment is in most Western states already gone. We invest more in the education of our kids than they will ever be able to earn to pay back what we did. This is one side. What happened is, if additional expansion was not sustainable, we got a movement toward intensification, which is then where new public management comes around, but also where assessment, accountability, and all this stuff comes around. The basic assumption being we didn't get enough value for money. The schools didn't do enough for the money they got. They should provide equity. If they don't do it, we make them do it. Not with additional resources or adding new school years, but by forcing the teachers to do better teaching. Or the hospitals. Or the law system, or whatever. As we moved from expansion towards a period of intensification, or also takes the discussions about whole day school and all this kind of stuff. All this is about intensifying. How do we get more value for the same or less money? This is the one development from the inside. From the outside, a second movement comes in addition, of course, globalization. The risk-sharing model was a closed shop model. This state provides you with risk-sharing in exchange for loyalty and money and taxes. But what happens if the risks are not decided inside that state? What happens if people migrate? What happens if you can end up in uh, not being able to provide those services depending on processes far away? A housing bubble in an, on another continent. What happens then? What happens at a time where a national state is less and less able to define its own policies. 
So now we are at the crossroads of two problems, kind of. The equity problem on the one side and the globalization problem on the other side. And what happens at the crossroads is this, a nation at risk. This is directly quoting from the opening statement of the nation at risk, you know, nation at risk, Reagan administration, early 80s, 83. In a committee where no real educators were part of the deliberation, of course. So we get the following. Our nation is at risk. Our once unchallenged preeminence in commerce, industry, science, and technology, and, and technological innovation is being overtaken by competitors throughout the world. We report to the American people that while we can take justifiable pride in what our schools and colleges have historically accomplished and contributed to the United States and the well-being of its people, the educational foundation, and so on, others are matching us. Incredible. What are we going to do? And this is one I love. If an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to oppose impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might well have viewed it as an act of war. <laughs> we have, in effect, been committing an act of unthinking, unilateral educational disarmament. You know, this is right in the middle of the discussions about NATO establishing new nuclear weapons in Europe and so on in the early 80s. And there he, they come and define the education thing as a war, as an international war, actually. An international war about preeminence, influence, wealth. We have lost sight of the most basic thing to do. This is a very strong language, isn't it? So you might expect, following this language, a call to arms. What about the values the American society is built around? Shouldn't we do more civic education? Civic education is not mentioned once in the whole document. Civic virtues, or the virtue issue at all, what I call the cultivation issue, is not mentioned once in the whole document. But the following. <coughs> And this kind of language you know ever since Clement and so on, or a little bit also Hannes. <coughs> Our goal must be to develop the talents of all to their fullest. Attaining this goal requires that we expect and assist all students to work to the limits of their capabilities. It's a pity that Astri Sonnen, who's a good friend of mine, is not around. I should love that. We should expect schools to have genuinely high standards rather than minimum ones, and parents to support and encourage their children to make the most of their talents and abilities. And, as I told you, we do not believe that a public commitment to excellent and educational reform must be made at the expense of a strong public commitment to the equitable treatment of our diverse population. The twin goals of equity and high-quality schooling have profound and practical meaning for our economy and society, and we cannot permit one to yield to the other, either in principle or in practice. So you see, exactly at the crossroads of the war, the global war, educational war, which PISA becomes the prime place to fight, and the equity problem puts the nation at risk. But it makes an important turn by dropping the cultivation issue from the agenda and redefining the whole problem as an achievement, as a qualification issue. If you look, as you have really to note the underlying shift of emphasis are right here. In spite of the language of war, which is used to expose the problem, the key problem in an ever more so socially divided society is not seen in a lack of social cohesion or cultivation. Nor is there a call to stand up and fight for the values on which the nation is said to be built. 
Rather, it is the insuff insufficient degree of qualification which current schools seem to provide, on, on which the effort is focused. Uh, for most of you, I don't have to recapitulate, uh, recapitulate what happens next. Standards movement, no child left behind, race to the top, and all this kind of stuff. You know all these. Uh, the most uh, scientific expression of this turnaround is, by the way, for me, in Europe, and more or less permeate, uh, so, uh, wandering through the uh, whole world, the funny competency concept. If you look at how competency is defined by Klima and others, which kind of produce the official understanding of competency, competency is first and foremost a cognitive achievement. Cultivation issues only show up in terms of motivation, motivation and willingness, willingness to perform according to the task. So it is the important change what happens here is it's not about qualification being a basis for cultivation, but cultivation being the backup of qualification. What happens actually is cultivation issues are turned into issues into obstacles for achievement. And then you get the whole discourse, right? Gender, race, poverty, and all this kind of stuff as obstacles for achievement. Not as rich source for cultivation, but as things which get into the way for optimal achievement production. This is pretty much reflected in, uh, no, I have to see where I am. Uh, lost again. Uh, yeah, this is uh, pretty much reflected in most of empirical research uh, in education. I just have one example which seems to be typical. Uh, oh, no, I didn't put it on. I read it for you. I forgot to put it. Even when the objectives of education change, the stable component in it is that at least schools and education have to contribute to the cognitive development of students. The same holds for teaching. teaching. Even when we expect that schools can contribute to more than academic outcomes, and teaching is more than instruction, effective instruction remains an important component. This is taken from Kremers, one of the big figures in efficiency research, but if you look throughout the whole literature, the argumentation is always like this. We are not against cultivation, believe me, not at all. We are not against civic education, of course not. We are not against this and that and culture and whatever you like to do. But the bottom line is academic achievement. This is what counts in the end. This is what teachers get evaluated on in the end. This is what kids get evaluated in the end. If you later on want to get to university, it's not about your civic engagement. It is about your characters, your achievements. If a school is deemed to be good or bad, it's basically done by achievements, not by diversity, not by cultural uh, uh, complexity or whatever. So this basic assumption has become a regular. That there is an idea behind which is funny following the history from Aristotle to today, which is that there is no trade-off between cultivation and qualification. That whatever cultivation we talk about, qualification is it. So, therefore, it's not a problem to have the same thing going on in countries like, let's say, China, Singapore, Norway, or Uzbekistan. Because the social fabric of society, which Aristotle pointed to, doesn't matter in that sense. It's about qualification. Cultivation, do whatever you feel is right in your country. Right? So this is a turnaround, which is very fundamental. I'm not going, because I lack time, to go into detail. But there is a incredible lots of research. This idea would only make sense if it even worked in its own sense if it would lead to more equitable and higher qualifications, but actually it does not. 
The data I get from all over the place, including Norway, is that we experience a growing segregation, a growing inequality in terms of qualification, not alone throughout the Western world. So actually, the outcome of this achievement first policies is not, in the long run, sustainable higher qualification levels, but actually growing dropout numbers, growing segregation effects, uh, growing special needs problems, and so on and so forth. I'm not going into details. You will find them in the paper, and I have to keep my timeline. So what is, just let get us the point, the, what I mean by the end of schooling as we know it, it is a turnaround from this basic idea of qualification being a tool of common schooling for shaping cultivation for shaping, sharing risk and sharing life towards turning qualification into the core issue. Here is all the collateral damage. I'm not going into it. Cultivation, so we get a new definition of schooling as it will be. Schooling for most students will be built around a task-based instruction provided by whoever is considered able to do so. Look at, for example, the demise of teacher education programs throughout the world. Teaching First, Teaching America, uh, uh, school-based programs, all kinds. Whoever is able to provide qualifications, welcome. We test you. And if you deliver qualifications, welcome to do so. Uh, whoever is considered able to do so, aiming at narrowly defined qualifications levels and concerned with cultivation only insofar as it is needed for maintaining or even improving the outcomes of the qualification process. Whoever is unable to compete or who wants more than this teaching to the test will have to look for other options outside the mainstream of public education. But let me just show you that. Uh, we, in most data, you find an ongoing fragmentation uh, which has a mainstream program within the qualification ways. You have then a top program combining qualification and cultivation at a high level, which is for those who have the resources to afford both cognitive resources as well as economical resources. And you get an ever-growing bottom group which is lost in the qualification ways, um, which one tries to, uh, to cultivate as much as necessary to keep them to being troublemakers later on in life. So you get a three, but actually, if you look around in many states, it's not only a three-track three solution. We have five-track solutions, 15-track solutions, 20-track solutions. We go from the concept of a common public schooling to a concept of target group schooling, depending on abilities, needs, and investments. The problem is, of course, in exactly in Norway, you should ask yourself that question if you take a look at the Norwegian history. Where would Norway be today without in its school, without comprehensive schooling? If you kind of destroy the one and only place where kids learn to join risks and to share risks and to develop an interest in common good, the common good as defined by Aristotle or also when whoever you prefer, if this kind of place is dissoluted fragmented in favor of a target group-based model of education and a task-based, as defined here, a task-based model of education, try to imagine what comes out of this. Don't get me wrong. I'm not defending schooling as we know it, the former schooling as we know it, because I agree totally it didn't deliver. And it's not depending if it was curriculum-based or didactic-based, if it was with or without assessment, or if it was with or without standards. Schooling, as we know it, made a promise, and this promise has never been fulfilled. Period. We should accept that one. We, education, at least the last 200 years, actually since Aristotle, we promised if we only were allowed to do the right thing, 
we would deliver. We still promised this kind of stuff, but we didn't. I'm not against assessment or standards. My question would rather be what kind of assessment and what kind of standards. I'm not even against, even though some may believe that, against stuff like PISA. This is not my problem. My problem is what does this indicate? So there's lots of research about the ups and downs and backgrounds of this. It's not my problem today. My problem today is what it may be this an indication of. And I would say, yes, we are close to the end of schooling as we know it. Close to the end of schooling as we have developed since Aristotle and colleagues. Yes, we are. Now you will say, show me the evidence, and I have to admit, yeah, it's complicated because this process is at very different stages in different countries. Most systems of schooling I know of, and I know quite a few, are still pretty much shaped by the former schooling as we know it. They are right in the middle of a transition process. So the question is, can we turn back the clock? If you know, some of you may know David Lavery's work on uh, someone has to fail and the school syndrome. David, like many others, there is a book coming around by David Hamilton. There is stuff written by Michael Young. As many of my colleagues ponder the idea, could we kind of save schooling as we know it or reconstruct it on a, in a better shape? I don't believe so. A, as I said, it didn't deliver. B, I don't believe that nation states are strong enough to get back to schooling as nation building. This is gone forever. The idea of national risk sharing project is at the end. It won't return. So what do we do? Here is, there are, of course, I jump over those questions here. There are, of course, many arguments. What happens to cultivation? What happens to cultivations? There are even colleagues developing new models of school development, which kind of are supposed to avoid the problems I have described here. You may know, for example, Hargreaves and Shirley's fourth way, right? which is nothing else than the softer side of the same process. They take Singapore as an example. Hey, come on, Singapore as an example for how to run schools. Or in, in, uh, even in Austria and in Germany, they now take Shanghai as an example how to run schools. Ever looked at society in Shanghai? How they deal with democracy issues, with migrants and all that kind? Thank you. Uh, there is, I lost my manuscript totally. Uh, I don't believe in this kind of stuff. Uh, there is a fifth way, maybe. Also if the fourth way is what Dennis and, and Andy are arguing for, I would call for a fifth way. And this fifth way is discussed, I can't go into detail today, by colleagues like David Hansen. Uh, if you don't know, you should know his work about uh, teachers as cosmopolitan educators. Or the works of um, Martha Nussbaum and others, who kind of try to reformulate the qualification cultivation equation on a new basis. Not talking about cultivating a national spirit, but cultivating a cosmopolitan spirit and at the same time relocalizing the qualification issue, also bringing the qualification issue back into the second line uh, and making it again dependent on local needs. There is a lot of thought around, brilliant stuff around, thinking about how to redo, redo this equation of qualification and cultivation in our times. However, this can't succeed if there are not important social forces backing that up. Who should that be? My one optimism I have left is that even those people who invented the current Achievement First movement internationally, even they 
tend to agree nowadays that qualification achievement first doesn't work. The most prominent example in the US being Diane Ravitch, you know her works. <laughs> but even Andreas Schleicher, Mr. Pisa, is now traveling around telling countries they shouldn't be worried so much about achievement levels as culturally issues were more important. So the problem is the achievement first movement suddenly realizes that it will get into the very same situation as schooling as we know it. It doesn't deliver. In the US, this has led to that more and more research money is taken away from education and moved to other disciplines because educators once again disappointed, totally. If you look at American journals, a friend of mine just did statistics on that. While in Europe, achievement first papers are still on the rise, also PISA-based, standards-based, and so on. In the US, they are sharply declining in educational journals. The issue is dead. Achievement first is dead in scientific terms. But this doesn't make for a new movement. We didn't deliver last time. Who are we to believe we will deliver next time? And here comes my problem, and I shall end with this because Barry is getting nervous that I'm taking too much time. Now listen. I do not say that it is us who made this transition from schooling as we know it to the schooling as we expect it. It could have happened without us. I believe so. But who was it who constructed equity as an achievement problem and not as a cultural problem? Who was it who constructed gender, race, poverty, and all this stuff as obstacles for learning? Who was it who develops the test materials, the assessment systems? Who writes the national reports? Who does an international comparison? Who kind of fuels this international discourse, achievement first, with all the material needed? It is us. We did it. We were so proud, first time in history, that I wouldn't be ashamed to admit that I'm professor of education, <laughs> and not like my dad expected to me to be in physics or math. Finally, I could say, I am into comparative education. Oh, you do PISA? Finally, we made it. It is us who did it. And don't come around and say, no, not me. Not the Pharisaic term. I'm not like this guy there. Not me. I'm into qualitative. I have nothing to do with that. I'm a reconceptualist, a pinerite, social constructivist. No. We didn't get into it. We didn't go and shape those large-scale assessments in a way not providing the material for this turnaround. We didn't go out into public and explain to them the price they were going to pay for that. Of course, a rich country like Norway, before you realize that you're distracting the very basic fabric of your society, it will be too late because you can pay your way to hell. Countries like Denmark with their national pride, it will take them a moment to understand they just destroyed civic education for good. It will take them a moment to realize that, that Igelund is not about civic education. Poorer countries, will, which need an instant payoff, will be in front of you, of course, with this transition. But my problem is it is us who provided the toolkit of this transition. So it should be us to be the very first to tell the public what they are going to pay for it. So you know where the word professor comes from? From the Latin profitero. Profitero, no, 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 not profit, means to express freely in public. So. Let's be true professors of education, of schooling, of curriculum, and go out and freely express that the, the end of schooling as we know it is approaching. Believe me, we can't avoid that one. But tell them what happens if we don't shape this process in a way which maintains the cultivation basis of civil society. Thank you.